Spring quarter, Jesus calls us. Unit two, experiencing the resurrection. A promise is made to Jesus' disciples. A lesson today comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And I'm coming from the Living Bible Translation. Dear friend who loves God, in my first letter, I told you about Jesus' life and the teachings and how he returned to heaven after giving his chosen disciples further instructions from the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, actually alive, and proved to them in many ways that it was really he himself they were seeing. And on these occasions, he talked to them about the kingdom of God. In one of these meetings, he told them not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them in fulfillment of the Father's promise, a matter he had previously discussed with them. John baptized you with water, he reminded them, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. And another time when he appeared to them, they asked him, Lord, are you going to free Israel from Rome now and restore us as an independent nation? The Father sets those dates, he replied, and they are not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power to testify about me with great effect to the people in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth about my death and resurrection. It was not long afterwards that he rose into the sky and disappeared into a cloud, leaving them staring after him. As they were straining their eyes for another glimpse, suddenly two white-robed men were standing there among them and said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring at the sky? Jesus has gone away to heaven, and someday, just as he went, he will return. Did you know that the preface to the book of Acts demonstrates its connection to the Gospel of Luke, since both are written by the same author? Luke begins by summarizing the contents of the book of Luke. And if Luke is the story of Jesus, then Acts is the story of the church. That the book of Acts is addressed to a certain person by the name of Theophilus. Although there has been considerable discussion as to whether this was an actual individual, perhaps a patron who funded Luke's work, as indicated by his title, Most Excellent, or whether the name is symbolic for Theophilus means lover of God or beloved of God and could be any child of God who reads the text. Therefore, we can read both Luke and Acts as having been written for us. That Jesus' statement that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, which you find in Acts 1 verse 8b, serves as the outline for the book of Acts. After Jesus' ascension, the good news of the gospel was indeed proclaimed first in Jerusalem. You find that in chapter 2 verses 14 through 36 then throughout Judea and Samaria, and that's Acts chapter 8, and then into Gentile territories. You'll find that in chapter 9, verse 1, through chapter 28, verse 31. This suggests even today that the Christian's primary, primary task is evangelism. 
that the opening scene, that in the opening scene, rather, Jesus' disciples witness his ascension. And in the next scene, they receive the Holy Spirit, who empowers them to perform signs and wonders, which proves that there is a link to the story of Elijah. For after he ascended to heaven, his disciple, Elisha, received a double portion of his spirit and was able to work miracles. One might draw a con connection to the ritual of ordination in the church, which symbolizes the transmission of power and authority to the newly ordained, both by the church and by the spirit. That after Jesus' ascension to two men in white robes appeared as they appeared to the women at the empty tomb in Luke chapter 24, verse 4, and asked the disciples why they were staring up into the heavens. The question served as a subtle reminder that they had work to do here on earth and that work included waiting patiently for the gift of the Spirit the return of Jesus, when they will receive the power that Jesus promised. Our historical, our biblical, historical, cultural, and geographical background. Although Bible historians suggest that the date of the writing of some of the New Testament books is not crucial the date of the writing of the book of Acts is vitally important because it is identified as a church history book. The Acts of the Apostles is considered to be the only inspired record of early church history. It is also the first and only primary historical account to a chronicle the earliest days of the Christian faith. Some biblical scholars even suggest that the book of Acts was written around AD 62 or a short time thereafter while Paul was in prison, while other scholars suggest that the book of Acts was written around AD 70 through AD 80, which makes provision for Luke to use the Gospel of Mark as source material for the Gospel of Luke. It is safe to say, however, that the book of Acts was written between AD 61 and AD 70, and it was most likely written in Rome. The Acts of the Apostles often referred to simply as Acts, or the book of Acts, is the fifth book of the New Testament. It speaks of the founding of the Christian church and the spread of its message to the Roman Empire. The book of Acts vibrates with life and action. In it, the Holy Spirit is at work in a phenomenal way. In Acts, the Holy Spirit is integrally involved in the forming of the church, the empowering of the church, and the expanding of the outreach of the church. The book of Acts serves as a bridge between the gospels and the epistles. It is a bridge between the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Christ life that is taught in the epistles. Biblical scholars suggest that the book of Acts is a transitional link between Judaism and Christianity and between the law and grace. In Acts, one sees how the Christian faith expanded from a small Jewish movement headquartered in Jerusalem to a worldwide faith that has made inroads into the imperial capital of Rome. One human weakness that many people struggle with 
is the temptation to become easily distracted. It is no doubt that there is a need to exercise a spirit of focus and discernment and not become easily distracted with passing fancies. Our lesson today focuses on the disciples intently looking up as their master, Jesus Christ, ascended into the heavens. The disciples were steadfast in their focus, so much so that two dressed men stood beside them and spoke. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. You find that in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. The fact that they were focused on that awesome event enabled them to be the recipients of a divine news flash. May we remain focused on the task God has called us to accomplish. The book of Acts is a historical account of the facilitating of God's plan to spread the gospel using the church as his chosen vehicle to accomplish his goal. While some refer to the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit, the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Church, it is accurate to simply refer to Luke's second volume as the book of Acts. Luke, the physician, is the author of the book of Acts. He was a fellow worker and traveler of Paul's. Paul referred to Luke as the beloved physician. You'll find that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. The book of Acts opens where the gospel of Luke closes, meaning the book of Acts is a sequel to the gospel of Luke. Acts chapter 1 sets the stage for the establishment of the church and the spread of the gospel. The entire book of Acts chronicles the formation and journey of the early church as it transitioned from the influences of Judaism into a Christ-centered, powerful witness to the first century world. Some biblical scholars suggest that the book of Acts covers approximately 33 years, which is even more interesting because Jesus' earthly life lasted 33 years. Acts chapter 1 finds Jesus still physically present on earth, and for the Holy Spirit to come, Jesus needed to ascend into heaven. You find that in John chapter 16, verse 7. The disciples obeyed Jesus' last instructions and waited in Jerusalem to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. But in a real sense, one could argue that Jesus is the primary actor in the book of Acts, working through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Our lesson explained. Luke, the author of the gospel that bears his name, is also the author of its sequel, the book of Acts. The former treatise or book mentioned in verse 1 speaks of the gospel of Luke. In the gospel of Luke, the author describes Jesus' work in Galilee, Judea, and especially Jerusalem. The book of Acts continues the story where the gospel leaves off by describing the early days of the church. In a real sense, Acts connects the gospels to the epistles. Both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are addressed to the same individual, Theophilus. Although not much is known about Theophilus, Luke refers to him as his title, the most excellent. 
in Luke chapter 1, verse 3. Hence, many biblical scholars, or therefore, many biblical scholars believe that Theophilus was probably a Gentile who was a high Roman official. The focus of Luke's first book was all that Jesus began both to do and teach. That's in verse 1. The word began suggests that the works and teachings of Jesus continued after his resurrection and ascension through the power of the Holy Spirit. To remove the doubts of his followers, Jesus facilitated many infallible, infallible proofs, verse 3, such as entering a locked room. Find that in John chapter 20, verse 19 showing his crucifixion wounds. You find that in Luke 24, 39. And eating and drinking with the disciples. You find that in Luke 24, verses 41 through 43. In verse 2, the word infallible in Greek is termerian, speaks of the fact that Jesus revealed himself in such ways that his appearances could not be denied. His desire was to leave no doubt that he was the same Jesus who died on the cross. Isn't it interesting that Jesus did not simply spend several hours giving convincing proofs that he was alive, but he spent 40 days between his resurrection and ascension, highlighting the reality that he was indeed alive. In verse 3, the word kingdom in Greek is basileus and refers to the rule and reign of God over his creation and has reference to the sovereignty, power, and authority of God. The subject of Jesus' post-resurrection teaching was the kingdom of God just as it had been the focus of his public ministry. And you'll find that in Luke chapter 4, verse 43. The kingdom of God also speaks of God's rule and reign in the hearts and lives of people as they experience forgiveness of sins and the good news of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8 records part of the final conversation between Jesus and his disciples. The emphasis was upon the Father's plan to spread the gospel throughout the world by relying upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In verses 4 and 5, Jesus commanded the disciples to remain in Jerusalem and to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. This would be the fulfillment of the Father's promise made earlier and recorded in both Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 and Luke chapter 3 verse 16. In verse 5, Jesus contra contrasted the baptism performed by John, the by John and the baptism provided by the Holy Spirit. John, physical in nature, with water while the Holy Spirit's baptism is supernatural in nature with the Holy Spirit. The passive tense of the Greek verb rendered, shall be baptized, highlights the fact that for this act to happen depended not on the efforts of the disciples, but rather on the divine action of God. While many denominations differ in the interpretation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Paul suggests that it refers to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each disciple. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is mentioned seven times in scripture. The first four times highlight John the Baptist's pronouncement that the one coming after him would baptize with the Holy Spirit. 
You find that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, Mark chapter 1, verse 8, Luke chapter 3, verse 16, and John chapter 1, verse 33. The fifth time it is mentioned is in our lesson, Acts chapter 1, verse 5, where Jesus emphasizes the filling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The sixth reference is in Acts chapter 11, verse 13, where Peter connects the Lord's promise of the filling of the Holy Spirit with events at Cornelius' house. The seventh reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, where Paul illuminates that all Christians have been baptized by one spirit into one body. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus repeatedly taught that God the Father would send the Holy Spirit. Now in the days ahead, that promise would be fulfilled as an endowment of power so the apostles could accomplish God's will. Although Jesus' promise of power for ministry was initially targeted to his chosen apostles, it is available to all believers because no one can fulfill God's purposes without the power of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. In verses 6 and 7, the potential of fulfilling this promise provoked the apostles to ask if Jesus was ready to restore Israel's kingdom. It is clear from their question that the apostles still possessed an earthly nationalistic view of what Jesus meant when he referred to the coming kingdom. In the disciples' minds, the kingdom of God and the Jewish nation were synonymous. Jesus quickly reminded them that it was not their business to know the time and date which God had established for this event to occur. The disciples were not to be concerned with the times and season and the season regarding God's plans. In verse 7, the word times in Greek is chronos, refers to the chronology or duration of the time and the word seasons, which is keros, refers in Greek, refers to the events or periods or ages that take place within time. Instead of scolding the apostles for their misunderstanding of him and the kingdom, Jesus redirected their focus to the task at hand and the purpose of the power they were to receive to accomplish his purpose. Rather than being fixated upon the times and seasons of the future, the disciples were to be focused on the proclamation of the gospel throughout the world. In verse 8, Jesus indicated that the Holy Spirit would enable the disciples to be his witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem and expanding into the world. Up to that point, they were eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and teachings, but now they would be empowered to witness about them. In verse 8, the verb shall receive in Greek is lambano and is in a tense and mood, future tense, and the indicative mood that suggests that this action that the disciples should obtain and of which they should take hold would occur in the future without human or origin. The word power in Greek is dunamis and speaks of miraculous ability, capability, or strength and is always used in reference to the power of the Holy Spirit. The word witness in Greek is martus 
which produces our English word martyr, speaks of one who bears witness to the truth of the gospel and is willing to suffer death for the sake of that cause. Verse 8 is a centerpiece verse in the book of Acts and reflects another record of the Great Commission given by Jesus found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 49, and John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. The book of Acts begins in Jerusalem and concludes in Rome, which is symbolically the ends of the earth because of what it represented in the first century world. That's why biblical scholars suggest that verse 8 highlights the outline of the book of Acts because it describes how the gospel was to spread geographically from Jerusalem, Acts chapters 1 through 7, to Judea and Samaria, Acts chapters 8 and 9, and to the ends of the earth, Acts chapter 10 through 28. After giving his mandates to the apostles to be his witnesses, Jesus ascended from the earth and disappeared into a cloud. Luke gives the fullest New Testament account of Jesus' ascension, although some have reduced this epoch event as a hallucination or a vision, Luke renders it as a real event. The phrase beheld, which in Greek is belipo, in verse 9, speaks of careful and intentional gazing or looking. Or looking. It has reference to seeing that perceives or understands. The phrase taken up in Greek is ipero, is a passive verb that means to be born upward. This suggests that an action was being performed on Jesus. He was literally taken up or lifted the cloud is a reminder to the disciples of the Shekinah, the visible manifestation of God's glory and presence in the Old Testament. Biblical scholars suggest that the cloud was a visible reminder that God's glory was present as the disciples watched the majestic ascension of Jesus Christ from earth. It is important to note that the ascension of Jesus is proof of his divinity, as is the resurrection. By the time Jesus ascended, the apostles knew exactly who he was. Jesus' departure was essential because it guaranteed the fulfillment of the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit to find in John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. As Jesus departed, the apostles continuously strained to see him. That's in verse 10. Even after he disappeared from their sight, the disciples continued looking intently up into the sky. Use of the, the phrase, look steadfastly, 
which is atiniko in um, Greek, means that the disciples fasten their eyes upon Jesus. They fix their attention on Jesus and strain their eyes to see Jesus as he was taken into the cloud. One can surmise that the disciples were astonished at the sight of Jesus' ascension. Suddenly, two angelic figures appeared in human form. They reprimanded the disciples for standing there gaping at the sight of their rising Savior. The angelic figures informed the disciples that Jesus would come back in the same way in which they had seen him go up. This statement comprises one of several statements scattered throughout the New Testament in reference to the parousia, which means the arrival or presence of someone. The word is used as a technical term for the coming of Jesus Christ in glory. Most commonly, parousia is known as the second coming of Christ at the end of the age. Jesus' ascension and promised return are the basis for Christian hope. Despite many failures, the disciples' hope of Jesus' return motivated them and the early church to continue Jesus' unfinished work of evangelizing the world. Jesus will return. The reality of an imminent return should motivate every believer to serve Jesus and continue his mission in the world. Some concluding thoughts or reflections. People want to know how to move forward when they feel powerless. How do we overcome feelings of powerlessness? Jesus tells the disciples to wait for the power that will come to them through the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is a fast-paced action-adventure book that recounts the birth and growth of the early church from the Jewish center of Jerusalem to Gentile to the Gentile capital of Rome. In addition, the book of Acts is a bridge-like continuation of the Gospels and connection to the epistles. But most of all, the book of Acts is a tribute to the transforming power of God through the acts of the Holy Spirit as evidenced in the lives of the apostles. In Acts, we observe a change in the apostles' lives from their being fearful weaklings to being dynamic witnesses. The apostles' transformation gives hope and encouragement for believers today. Jesus' plans for the church was larger than anything the disciples could have imagined. Likewise, Jesus' plan for our lives is larger than anything we can imagine. God calls us to become transformed witnesses for him in a world gone wild, will you be a witness? The spread of the gospel in Acts. Rome, Italy, Macedonia, Achaia, Crete, Asia, Galatia, Cyprus, Judah, Egypt, in all the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may we be the generation that finally fulfills your desire to share our witness about your Son, Jesus Christ, with all the people of the earth. Grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit each day to accomplish the mission to which you have called us 
because we are unable to accomplish it on our own. We need your power and may your Holy Spirit give us strength and courage to work toward this goal. Eternal God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.